was shooting Khari, that was in 1982. There were still some left here on this side. So many of my friends who came to attend the film yeah. from Europe, they came here. They could smell good films here. But uh, we smell nothing but stink. But they could smell good films. But I asked them not to lean against the walls. And now you see everything has fallen down. But if you love catching fish, you can come here. If you are a good angler, you can come here. And you have to take the permission of the owners of the studio. We got plenty of fish here around. And how old is this? Uh, uh, last 56 years it is operating. This is one of the oldest uh, studios. The oldest. I see. I remember to have come here for the first time after I finished my college education to come here because my subject was physics. Uh, as a student of physics I got interested in sound recording. So I came here to study sound recording. And Anjan's grandfather, who was the owner and was a legendary figure in Bengali cinema, he told me, I will teach you everything, but then I will throw you out of the studios because it is a very bad place. And then I started working here. I was asked to start from the scratch. So I was sent to that room, that hatchet room. That used to be the maintenance room. So my job was to solder capacitors and condensers and I was I was thoroughly disappointed because my interest was in the mathematics of sound recording not in uh, doing this you know, the soldering capacitors and condensers so I was there for two months only and after that I left so that was all and then what did I do I was here for two months and in two months I, for a moment, I didn't come to the studio. And there were very, very important actors like Shobhi Biswas and others, and uh, S.D. Burman, who was also making music here. But for one single day, I didn't come here, because I had no interest in cinema as such. And uh, I was not even a habitual film goer. And then what happened after that, you know, I came out, I used to read books on uh, <coughs> sound recording as much as I could run into at uh, uh, you know Imperial Library which is now called National Library so I do I sound old when I talk about the Imperial Library and the British period and all I don't want to sound old at all because I always consider myself to be younger than my son and maybe I feel like behaving like a woman who doesn't want to count her age after 25. So, I think I am one year and a half younger than my son. This is how I was. So, I don't want to sound old at all. But that was this uh, Imperial Library when I started uh, reading books on sound recording. And eventually, and very accidentally, I ran into a book on the aesthetics of cinema. And I was pulled over completely. And then I started reading books on the aesthetics of cinema, as many books as could be available in the library, in Imperial Library. And then I started watching films, mostly Indian films and the Hollywood films. So I didn't find anything of whatever I could read in the books. So my, my passion for cinema, which I derived from the books, and my hatred for cinema, the way cinema was being made, two things grew together. I started watching films, mostly Indian films, and I hated these films. But since then, I started writing on cinema, on the aesthetics of cinema, on cinema and poetry, on cinema and painting, on the dialectics of cinema, something like this. And then I thought I could be a good filmmaker. And when I made my first film without having much of education, practical education, well, <coughs> A woman uh, actress 
very famous at that time. She became a producer. She thought I could make a film. And I made one. And that was the biggest of all big disasters that could ever happen under the sun. It was a lousy film, lousiest of all lousy films ever made. And I thought filmmaking is not my cup of tea and I left filmmaking and became a medical detailer, selling medicines without knowing anything of medicine. But since I thought that I could talk well and the doctors also thought so, I became quite important as a medi medicine seller, but then left the job and started making films again. for quite a long time. Well, uh, Daishi Savan is not a film on famine, even though famine had a great impact on me, which was the direct result of the war economy which was thrust on us by the British imperialists. But then my primary job was to depict the human relationship. And uh, human relationship is, can be felt intensely only when you pass through a crisis. So that is why I place the whole story against the, the famine years. Uh, <coughs> it even started a little earlier, but the relationship got worsened during the famine. And my job was not to show the horror or the cruelty of the famine, but it, I call it a cruel film. I was not interested in how many people died out of starvation. I know the five million people in one year just dropped and dropped dead. But then that was, it was, it would have been very journalistic had I given an account of the deaths. My interest was to show how during this social calamity, which killed so many people, how the last vestige of human decency in us also gets lost liquidated and that was the point I wanted to make among, uh, between the man and the woman, the husband and wife and interestingly the wife was very young and the husband was middle-aged so difference of age was embarrassingly wide. On the top of it by Indian standard the man looked rather ugly so that was it. So that to a certain extent uh, you know, contributed, that contributed to a certain extent to the relationship, you know, heightening the relationship, you know, making it more dramatic. And because of the war, the, uh, the famine started. And because of the famine, how we also lose human decency, that was it. Can you think of any scene today that somehow symbolizes for you the essence of that loss of human decency? In, in that well, case? that was when uh, the family starved for three days, didn't have a grain of rice to eat. Then finally on the fourth day, the husband could organize some rice for them. And the man ate the entire f rice like a glutton. And when he was eating, as he was eating, he didn't stop for a moment, he was looking into the bowl. And the woman, who was also starving for three days, 
what did she do she was she looked deep into the man with hatred which could be read on the face of the woman madhavi and she played marvelous role and she was looking deep into the man and was pouring rice giving rice to him and when it came to her she had very little to eat and she didn't eat at all and when the man could realize that the that he ate all the food and didn't leave much for the woman and the woman was decent enough not to say it but by his gesture she wanted to make it known that you didn't leave anything for me but she had that element of decency why she didn't say it she was not articulate about it and right at the moment the man thought what did i do i wish i could vomit it out and that night this woman came from the bed and the husband could hear him hear the woman talking to her friend i said well i don't mind starvation i had been starving <clears throat> when i was being reared up in a family uh, a very poor family well then <clears throat> i didn't mind that i see that he is changing he has been changing and uh, her friend was telling her that well the things are changing these days and she said has everything changed did i change i didn't mind it when i saw her for the first time when i saw him for the first time i mean the husband when i saw him for the first time i i survived but don't you see i have been denied of a womanly existence now this is what she realizes right now when the crisis deepens only then <coughs> she realizes that she has been denied of a healthy womanly life she didn't have it and that also you know comes to her at a time when the situation is terrible these are the things which i try to portray and that shows the loss of human decency from either side and that is what i wanted to show and that is how i wanted to show the horror of the of this social calamity you know when you come to social calamities in in your films especially uh, the more overt the political phase of your career Uh, films like Interview, Calcutta Seventy One. Uh, there is almost an agit prop style. There is almost uh, a stridency. Is almost one can say a very strong anger. Uh, and yet there is also experimentation. There mm. isn't that that narrative style which was there in Vaishnav. Yes. You know, true. Uh, why did you choose to depart? Well, I have always been moving uh, along with the time, and the time had been chasing me. so this is what happened here as well baisha sabun was made in 1960 when i took to the narrative style and i wanted to tell a complete fleshy story later on but frankly if i look back i got this idea of non narrative by reading books because when i was a student i was very fond of all the saxley i was not that much enamored by by all the saxley later on but right at that time in my formative period i was very much under the influence of all the saxley who believed in this non narrative sort of thing and many more things and during and the time you refer to i met interview you met you mentioned two films interview and calcutta 71 that was the time when calcutta was going through a terrible <coughs> you know atmosphere climate there was anger and unrest in the air and i couldn't escape it i was taken in and that was the time when i thought that uh, like the people a majority of the of the militants they thought they asserted that their condition is rebellion i also thought in thought in identical manner and that was the time when i thought i should go in for ajit pop type of thing it was also the same thing in uh, in uh, the early phases of soviet film i mean after 20s when they were making films of the revolution october revolution even before that 1905 revolution well that was the kind of thing which i took to at that time and that was why i felt now as i look back i feel i have no 
regrets for what I did at that time because that was very necessary for me to go, grow. But that was the time when I could see, if I look at my old films, I mean films of the late 60s and early 70s, there were more of blatancy, more, less of reason, and uh, much less of uh, uh, self-criticism. Do, so, do you think at that period you thought that you could use cinema to change society? Well, uh, in a way, I thought so, like many people. What did you think? I remember, I thought that uh, this film would be able to groom the people, uh, such films, would be able to form opinions. And I remember much later, when I quietened down considerably, because, again because of the time, when I thought it is absolutely necessary to do a fair amount of self-criticism, asking questions yourself. That was the time when accident. Yes. yes. About this, uh, your film, do you think it was kind of? Good? Well, that was the time when I thought that uh, the cinema can change the society. Can cinema can build public opinion? For that matter, any art form could do that. I thought it like that. And it did to a certain extent for the simple reason that the time was very, very favorable to such a situation. The people were also looking for such things. And uh, they responded very positively to such things. For instance, in Calcutta 71 or in interview, even after the interview show, I remember after the first show, towards the end, there was shouting, that they started chanting slogans, the people inside the theater. And when my cameraman Mahajan and I, we came out, and for the first time I could see that a cameraman was also mobbed by people. And there were thousands of people. I, I should also tell you something about it. It's a very the contradiction which we all people suffer, also in Bengal. And uh, you know that uh, Bengal is considered to be politically very hot. So after the first show of interview, a lot of young people, very vibrant young people, they mobbed us, me and Mahajan, my cameraman, and started chanting slogans, Minal Sen Zindabad, Mao Zedong Zindabad, and all these things. And then someone came forward, and I could see that he was trembling, and he was so much with the film, and she embraced me, she kissed my hand, and suddenly came very close to me, and asked me, how is it that most of your technicians are non bengalis It's bad. But just before that, he said, workers of the world unite. So that was something which is very interesting.